So um, hello everyone, my name is Sandy Robertson. I'm an emergency medicine ST6. Uh, and so that's, I'll be finishing and hopefully being a consultant uh, in December this year. Uh, thanks for joining up um, and joining tonight and um, coming to listen about environmental sustainability. I'll give you a little bit more of a background about myself. So I am the chair of the environmental specialist interest group at the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. That's a lot of words, but that's the group that uh, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine or RCM have created to make RCM itself more environmentally sustainable, look at advocating on swifter action on climate change in society, society and linking the health effects of climate change uh, to make, make that more widely known, and also um, looking at how we can make the practice of emergency care more environmentally sustainable. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about the reasons why we need to think about this. We're all working in an emergency care crisis. It's That itself is overwhelming. So why are we taking this extra work on? Um, explaining about how the, the health effects of climate change and how they affect the patients that we see, and then going on to talking about what we can do about um, the sustainability of our practice. Sometimes when we talk about climate change, it is really tricky and it can bring a lot of negative thoughts and feelings. So I want to leave everyone with a bit of hope today because there is hope out there. Um, and hopefully you'll find something interesting and something new that you hadn't heard before. It'd be great to get any questions or, or um, comments that you can make. Um, it'd be great to get a chat going on in the end. So there's about 10 words or to describe climate change, you just need to um, use 10 words and I'll go through them now at the moment. So we've got it's real. Uh, climate change is real. It's happening. It's caused by us. Um, and this picture that you can see behind me is a really good graphic. It's called the climate stripes. You can follow that QR code there to go and work out the climate stripes wherever you work. Uh, it's a lovely way to get across um, what's going on. You can see from the left side to the right side, it's getting from uh, blue to darker red. So the each stripe is a year after the post-industrial times when we started pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And you can see that we're getting darker uh, red. And so on average, the years are getting hotter than they have been before. It's a really um, striking and impactful way of getting across climate change. You can get on pin badges. I wear one on my lanyard. People have turned it into dresses. People have put it on um, the reusable face masks that you have there. So it's a great way of kind of letting people know what's going on. So that's the first of the two 10 words. It's real. It's us. It is us. Um, we've been pumping carbon dioxide, as I said, into the air since the um, start of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution has given us lots of great things, uh, but unfortunately now the consequences of us driving our cars um, with internal combustion engines and uh, using kind of coal and gas burning to make our electricity and things is causing the climate crisis and that's affecting our health. Experts agree is the next two words. So the science and evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. And any further delay in concerted global action will miss the brief, rapidly closing window to cure a liberal future. And um, that's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're the WHO organization, or the, sorry, they're the um, or worldwide organization who ha are there to report about climate change. And they have been correct in all of their kind of um, forecasts of the CO2 level rise and, and the effects it's going to have on the planet. Um, they came out with a report yesterday, which you might have seen in the news, which is pretty grim reading. Um, and again, they agree that the climate climate change is happening and it's caused by us. Uh, but they also say that there is stuff that we can do right now to tackle this. It's bad. This is a picture of one of the um, communities destroyed in the forest fires in uh, America in the last few years. And you've seen floods and um, huge kind of storms all over the world, all created by climate change. But there's hope. We've got everything that we need at the moment to tackle the climate crisis. We've got all the information, we've got all the knowledge, we've got all the know-how. What we're really lacking is the will to change society as quickly as possible. And this is actually something that's really important for us as healthcare professionals to know. We There's been studies that have shown that if we connect people in people's mind the health effects of climate change, um, and make that more clear, then there's swifter moves to tackle climate change in society. We're also really trusted professionals within society, especially nurses in this group. Um, people listen to what we have to say. So if we're talking about it and saying that there's a link between climate crisis and health, 
and we need to change stuff to improve our health that's a really key message to get across there to get people to um change how they live their lives but also how as a society we do things and and we can do this quickly going back to the climate emotions thing so this is an infographic that we've i've created in the past if you want to go on any of these um, QR codes, because talking about the climate crisis and you know the um, global warming can make people feel pretty bad. It makes me feel pretty bad a lot of the time, thinking what might happen in the future. Uh, these are all the different ways that you can do to kind of tackle any of those negative thoughts and feelings. One of the best ways to do that is to get out into nature. It's really difficult when you're shift workers like us um, and on the road all the time, but even a few minutes kind of in nature when you can grab it can really help yourself and just feeling really present and in that moment. Um, and there's no shame in feeling bad about it. It's a horrific thing that we have to get, we're facing as a society. But again, it's something that we can all um, do, do something about. So if we go back to the it's real, it's us, experts agree, it's bad, there's hope, but put a, a health lens onto it. There's this really great um, graphic, which was actually just published last week, um, which shows kind of the health effects of climate change. If you look on the bottom in that picture, there's the ecological determinants of health. So extreme weather can cause harm to people with big storms and the trauma, direct trauma that's affected by that. Habitat and biodiversity loss. So we, you know, we depend on a healthy habitat and a healthy biosphere to uh, where we grow all of our food and uh, support us and if we, if that gets degraded then the nutrition of our food gets degraded and our health gets affected um there is kind of water sort shortages that you've seen around the world with the droughts in the uk and all over the over the world and you know reducing your access to water and you know being more dehydrated inc causes increased risks of you know kidney disease and things like that and then at the end you've got sea level rise and all of the effects that can do to the communities that live by the sea if you look at the top, there is the direct um, impacts on health and you will have seen people who are unwell because of the climate crisis in your practice if you're working in the UK and especially if you're working in other places around the world. Um, with the heat waves that we saw last summer, there's heat related illness. So there's um, heat stroke and heat exhaustion and all of the spectrum that you've got there. Uh, we know that mental health crises increase in heat waves as well. So there's an, um, an interesting paper that shows an increase in suicidality when the heat gets high and there's an increase in interpersonal violence. So you'll definitely have been seeing people affected by a climate crisis. Asthma, COPD, pulmonary disease, um, all caused by the air pollution, by you know us driving our cars, burning gas to make electricity um, and kind of uh, all, all, all that. Um, and the infection as well, there's thoughts that, you know, um, the COVID pandemic, don't, you know, we always have to bring that up because it's a big thing that's happened. But, you know, it's um, loss of the biosphere and people coming closer to animals can, you know, can be thought to help spread diseases and things like that. And if we look a bit closer to home, West Nile virus is making its way up into Europe where it hadn't been before. And then if you look in the middle, there's a social and structural determinants of health, health and we all know that we see people affected by uh, their health, affected by their lot in life and um, the support that they've got around them. And there's all these things that you can see that support our health, like housing, livelihoods and equity and education and supply chains that we all depend on now can all be destabilized by the climate crisis. And if we look in our health system, so we, we can see more patients who've got heat stress or more patients on really bad air, air day and that might overwhelm our healthcare systems. Um, there's risk to people working in the hospitals and in your ambulances when it's really hot. Um, and last year in the heat waves, we also saw the whole IT system of One London Trust collapse because it overheated. So health systems are also going to be affected by climate change. It's us in health. So how is it us? The, in, in the NHS and other similar healthcare systems, it's about four to five percent of the carbon footprint of the whole country. Um, that's one of the key things that I think is a really hopeful thing is if you look at us who works in the NHS and um, I, I checked the numbers for Scotland, it's, you know, less than one percent of the population of Scotland work in the NHS, but it accounts for about four to five percent of the carbon footprint. So if we can change things in where we work in the in the institutions that we work in, we can really amplify anything that we do on an individual level. So by working together and changing the healthcare system, we can really improve what we might do individually. This is a breakdown of the NHS. This um, graphic is taken from 
uh, the Greener NHS, which is the body in the NHS in England, which looks at the environment sustainability. You can see that the biggest chunk is medicines, medical equipment and other supply chain. And that's all the things that we use and buy and bring in to do what we do every single day. Um, and there's changes going on with that at national level in all the devolved nations. And particularly if you look at the greener NHS in England, they've made new rules that if you want to sell into the NHS in England, then the company that is trying to sell into it also has to meet strict environmental sustainability criteria. So by the NHS making that change and being one of the biggest employers and bigger biggest buyer of goods in the UK, not only are you changing the health service, but you're making knock on steps to the rest of society and making other companies that want to sell to you be more environmentally sustainable. So you, you can see that that itself is amplifying any effects that we might have. And then if you look at the NHS itself, you've got building energy, water and waste. And then a really big chunk is the anaesthetic gases. So any anaesthetists among us or people who work with anaesthetics, um, you might have seen one of the big things is they've got rid of desflurane, which is a huge greenhouse gas itself. Um, other anaesthetic gases like um, sevoflurane are much better for the environment. So in Scotland, that's actually just been completely banned and they're really reducing it in England and Wales as well. And then business travel and NHS fleet is the next one down there. So that's people coming to the hospitals themselves and by ambulance and by, by um, hospital transports. Um, and then the personal travel, sorry, the, the net patient travel is 5%, business travel and NHS is, fleet is 4%. And then if you look, there's staff commuters, 4% as well, and visitor travel. So thinking about how we get to and from the hospital is something else that we can really improve the environmental impact of the health service. So experts agree, why is uh, the climate crisis a healthcare crisis? So the Lancet described that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. And you might see that as all of the reasons I've just explained. This was this statement was put out before COVID and, you know, COVID and other pandemics are more likely to happen because of climate change. So I think they're all connected. And, you know, COVID was horrific and I, I treated patients in the, all the waves myself and kind of fully joined with all of you in the stress and horror of what, what that was like. But I know that, unfortunately, the climate crisis and the health effects that's coming from that are going to be worse and are worse. And we're kind of experiencing them all the time. Um, so trying to uh, tackle the climate crisis at its root, so that would be getting swift decarbonisation of society, will lead to a much improved health for all of our patients and ourselves and a livable, livable world for the future. It's bad. Um, I've kind of hinted at this and things before, but if we look at the hottest day in England last year, that showed about 638 more deaths than normal. And we would have seen that in the emergency care services and more people coming in with strokes, not just heat stroke, more people with heart attacks, more people with suicidal ideation and maybe completing suicide, more people with interpersonal violence, all because of the heat. And we know that the, the temperatures are just going to get hotter and hotter. So we're going to see more and more heat waves and more and more events like this. Um, and that is obviously just kind of amplified if you live closer to the equator and in hotter countries. Um, so it, it, it is bad. But there is hope. Um, I get great hope because people are now talking about the climate crisis and its health effects. And, I, you know, I've been invited to talk to you here today and people are interested in it. Uh, so there is a really good community in the healthcare system coming together to try and see what we can do and take that. 5% that we create just by working down to something a lot, a lot smaller and even make it carbon or net zero or low carbon. In England, um, if you work in England, there is the Greener NHS. Uh, so I'd really recommend going onto the websites and seeing what they're doing. They proudly announced, I think at COP26 in Glasgow, that they had the first ever completely electric ambulances. And they're work looking at really big systemic issues um, within the health service and really trying to tackle that, trying to tackle things that we can't do on the shop floor because you, you need a bigger body to kind of deal with that. If you look around the world, there's about, um, I think 20 other countries have signed up to the COP26 um, kind of climate smart healthcare um, pact. So that's um, all of the country, countries in the global north. So. Um, I think, well, maybe not the States, but um, us, um, lots of the European countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand have all signed up to 
um, develop climate smart healthcare and work out what a uh, low carbon healthcare is. I'm going to shout out to our own group. So the Green ED, um, which I'll talk a little bit later, is the how we at Arkham are trying to make the practice environment of emergency medicine more environmentally sustainable. And then we've got Health Declares and other groups that you might see out there. So Health Declares is a campaign group, a bit like MedAct, um, if you've heard about them. And they look at trying to talk about the health effects of climate change and link that to th changes that we might need to make in society. So like pushing for more environment, uh, sorry, more renewable energy and things like that. So whatever you want to do um, within healthcare and the in interface with climate, there's a group of people out there already doing work and you can join them. Um, and this is where I get my hope because we might despair sometimes when we don't see as much action as we might want in the climate sphere with certain governments. But if you look below the governmental level, there's people all around the country and all around the world trying to make sustainable changes um, and tackle this uh, climate crisis so that we can turn things around in the small, small window that we have to ensure that we've got a livable future coming up. So that is kind of the big picture stuff. And hopefully that explains a bit about the health effects of climate change and uh, what we can do about it and the importance of healthcare people being involved in this. The next thing to move on to is how do we go about addressing sustainability in, in the healthcare system? A big headline is that no one really knows what um, a net zero healthcare system is like because it doesn't exist yet. Um, and that's work that's, again, going on nationally, trying to look at the most sustainable ways to do things. And almost every specialty that I know in the healthcare system has got people thinking of what a low carbon um, endoscopy would look like or what low carbon emergency medicine is um, and or what low carbon pediatrics is and trying to define that and get to a place where we can be as net zero as possible. The main way that people are doing that is thinking about the well-known um, kind of fundamentals of sustainability. We all know reduce, reuse, recycle. You can see that in this picture here. Um, it's been increased a little bit because there's a few other things that are maybe a little bit better than reduce, reuse and recycle. So the first one is prevent. Um, and for us in healthcare, that's thinking about public health interventions. So can we advocate for our patients to get around by active transport, have healthy diets, uh, smoking cessation, talk about air pollution levels and linking that air pollution to people's health and saying, actually, do you need to drive your car for a short distance? Not only are you harming the planet, but actually sitting in that car with the fumes from your own exhaust is actually causing you harm yourself. Um, there is a great campaign group called Mums for Lungs, if you want to look up for them, and they look at trying to get people to just turn off their cars when they're idling um, and it, highlighting kind of the health effects that idling in your car does to yourself. It, you know, it's sitting in your car, you've actually got a kind of higher exposure to kind of bad air, air particles than if you're kind of cycling or walking down the road. And then going to reduce. So there's lots of um, things out there. So you might have seen there's the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. They've got a Choosing Wisely campaign and they've got hints and tips from all over the healthcare system about how you can kind of make different choices and how you practice to either improve patient safety or um, your efficiency of how you're doing. And there's a few things there which are also environmental. So um, think about using tap water instead of sterile water when you're washing out wounds. A Cochrane review just showed that it was just as safe as using sterile water. And if you use those big plastic bottles of sterile water and you chuck them out, um, that's actually, there's a lot of savings if you just stop using those and use your tap water. Um, can you think of switching from IV paracetamol back to just oral? Or um, if, you know, if someone accepts it, PR paracetamol, uh, there's lots of different switches that we can make to use less intense invasive treatments which just work just as well for our patients so that's kind of what reduces like another big thing in that for the green ed is looking at reducing unnecessary cannulas there's been quality improvement projects throughout lots of emergency departments showing that there's around about 40 percent of cannulas are just never used so why are you putting it in, in the first place and um, patients have seemed happier with that not having to have a cannula they don't need and then reuse in healthcare, so not reusing any kind of equipment um, that shouldn't be reused, but moving back to uh, reusable suture kits, which get autoclaved and cleaned, that's much more environmentally sustainable than the ones we just chuck away. Reusable PPE, that can be washed as well. There's some really good reusable um, type two face masks out there, which are much more comfortable um, to use and um, thinking of all the ways that we can safely reuse things. 
Um, we've got kind of repair and recycle. So fixing equipment. So your states where you work can do a lot with your equipment. Make sure if you see a piece of broken equipment, you try and get it repaired first before just chucking it out and buying a new one. Recycling, and I always say that recycling and plastic waste is like the gateway drug to environmentalism in healthcare. Everyone hates the amount of plastics that we throw out. The best way to improve that is to reduce the amount of plastics we're using, as I've said before. So reusable equipment and autoclaving and things like that. Or looking at the recycling bins we have in our departments, there's also um, good websites out there or things that your, your departments can um, sign up to where you kind of share you can post on online within your within wherever you're working saying well I've got a bunch of chairs that we don't need to does another department need it and um one of those is called warp it so if you look that up it's a way of an institution is just making sure that you're not throwing out stuff that other people might need um it's a bit like Facebook marketplace um or gumtree for the for institutions and then recover so if we're disposing of stuff can when we dispose of it for example when we have to burn certain things are we using the heat created by burning that to heat the hospital? So you're actually recovering a bit of energy there. Um, and then the last thing you need to do is just dispose of things without getting anything back. So if you want to think about starting to make any changes in your practice, these are this is the way to do it. Um, and just think of what you could do with any of those things. The next slide is a picture of the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, um, from an attendance at an emergency department and you can see the link there to see where this has come from so this would be a patient coming in with a broken ankle and this is the breakdown of the percentage of the greenhouse gas emissions you can see in emergency department the main part of it is energy we're on our lights are on heating's on 24 hours a day seven days a week so how can we reduce that um, and ways of reducing that we find in the green ed is reducing our screen brightness or making sure that computers in the part of the department that isn't used as much overnight just get turned off automatically or you've got those light switches which just turn off if you're not in there and you go to led lights um, and is your heating from renewable energy do you have can you do you have a big estate wherever you work where you can put solar panels or you know at a higher nhs level can you have wind turbines in a few places so um, that's a big thing for uh, emergency medicine. And then you can see the next is travel medical gases. So this person used nitrous. That's a really hot, big hotspot in the emergency practice. Nitrous oxide itself is a greenhouse gas, 300 times stronger than carbon dioxide itself. So if you can reduce your nitrous any way possible, that's a big impact you can have. And then you can see that equipment and consumables are the next two big things that you can think about um, in the greenhouse gas emissions. So are we reducing the amount that we just consume and throw away in how we treat people? And can our equipment be reusable as much as possible? So we're move, I'm gonna move on quickly to the Green ED, and this is how we're doing it within the emergency department. We're all overworked. We've all got too much going on. Um, and how, how can we suddenly just think, oh, I'm gonna make environmentally sustainable choices and at what we've done with our group that I'm leading is to try and make that as easy as possible for you. Um, we've created this framework. It can be it's broken into bronze, silver and gold actions. And each action, when you sign up to this group and you get access to it, you'll be able to click on any of these things and find out how it's been done at another place. Find out, um, example, quality improvement project write ups or quizzes or carbon calculators are affected with them and really does all the hard work for you so you don't have to and you can go around and just think oh I want to do this in my place this is how I do it um, and we're trying to make it as simple as possible we came up with these actions by thinking through the whole of our experiences of emergency medicine practice looking at things that people have done in other specialties and seeing how it fits into uh, emergency medicine and we've gone to it from there this is a good starting point every country in the UK has now got a, a net zero target by 2040 or 2045 so we're hoping that over the next 15 20 years well as we develop this and we define what a low carbon or net zero emergency healthcare is if you do in your department all up to all the gold actions then you will be a net zero health um, net zero emergency department so that's our ambition for the future um, the other thing is that a lot of things that we do in emergency um, medicine are done in other parts of the hospital. So this can be shared all around the hospital. 
Um, if you want to find out more, you can just go, you know, follow us on Twitter. You can email environment at rchem.ac.uk. So the idea is it's simple, it's easy, and you can be accredited as a department for this. So if you do all the bronze actions and you feed back to us that you've done that, then we'll accredit you for that and you'll be a bronze or a silver or gold uh, emergency department. It was based, I have to do a shout out, it was based on LEAF, which is a laboratory assess efficiency assessment framework that's run out of UCL. It's now in 81 institutions, over 14 countries and about 1,400 labs. It's also in any of you, in your clinical labs. So if you know anyone who works as a um, biomedical scientist or in the labs and hospitals, then get them to have a look at LEAF because they might be able to improve the environmental sustainability of the labs there. And I thought I'd just share this little video with you about the experience of um, one of our team members in Preston and how they felt uh, setting up a Green ED department went. So it surprised me how open and enthusiastic my colleagues were about this project. I've always had a personal interest in environmental sustainability um, and bringing that into the workplace, but I thought that was just my thing. And then we took this idea to the department we asked for everybody's thoughts and we developed a group of about 30 people ranging across the department. So not just doctors, they included our nurses, our consultants, our healthcare assistants, our domestics, um, our admin staff, all trying to feed into this idea of sustainability and how we could improve our department. And I think that enthusiasm and that proactive attitude was really important. So that's just to give you a little idea of um, the experience of some one person there and actually setting up uh, the first thing that anyone doing the Green ED project in their department should do, we advise, is setting up a green group. You will find loads of people in your department who are keen to do this. And it's really important that we get everyone who works in the department from porters, HCAs, uh, PAs, uh, ANPs, nurses, uh, all the doctors of all the different levels involved and the admin staff because only together will we be able to make all the changes. I'm now just going to highlight a few of the um oh, so it could, surprised me the video how open at um highlight some of the key quick things that we can do. So if your department is using Ventolin um rather than Salamol, Ventolin is the branded one. Um, if you're using Ventolin rather than Salamol, then the for your blue inhalers, then the gas which drives the Ventolin, which squishes it out, is more of a um, greenhouse gas than Salamol one. So switching from Ventolin to Salamol can make a huge difference to the greenhouse gas impact of, of people who are suffering from asthma and the people that you're treating with. It makes no difference to their experience of treating their, um, their illness. Um, and it's also a lot cheaper. So Salamol is just a lot cheaper than Ventolin. Um, inhalers, we focus on them because inhalers are actually quite a um, big percentage of the greenhouse or the carbon footprint of um, medications that we use. And we often hand these out to patients if they're being discharged safely from our departments. The next better thing than these meter dose inhalers are the dry powdered inhalers that you might have seen. They're the ones which click and they're activated just by taking the deep breath in. I don't think it's really our place in the emergency setting to say, oh, you're in the middle of an asthma attack. Why don't you try this new inhaler? That's just not going to fly with anyone. It's not safe. But if we had thought with our preventative health um, hats on for a second, in the same way as we might talk to people about smoking cessation, if they come in with asthma and they're smokers, we might also say, if you want, when you come out, we can get you put in touch with your GP or the, whoever in your primary care setting to think about moving to a dry powdered inhaler because that's actually better for the environment and in turn better for you. So we can actually get put the idea in people's heads that they can make the switch if they choose to later on um, without kind of coming to any harm um, in, in their exacerbation they're having there. And that's a good way that we could think about of, you know, making that link in people's heads between health and, and climate. People I can see in the... Um, messages I talked about with nitrous. So I hit I hit on that a little bit before. Nitrous oxide, entonox or equinox, you will see in the um, canisters you use is 300 times more of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It lasts in the air for hundreds of years and it will continue to warm um, and add to global warming. 
And there are alternatives out there to use. There's methoxyfluorine or penthrox, which is much less of a greenhouse gas. Um, and I think the main things if you're working in your hospitals is to see, does your hospital have nitrous pumped in or plumbed into the wall? Because we know that actually about a third of that is just lost through leaky pipes into the atmosphere. So you're spending money on something you're not even using or getting to your patients. Um, if you're the, then the next thing. So if you're in manifolds, a good thing to be would be to turn that off and then just use your um, cylinders. The next thing, if you're using your cylinders, make sure you use absolutely everything in the cylinder, because when if the cylinder goes back to um, the companies that give it to you and it's not completely empty, they just vent that into the air and fill it up again. So you need to make sure that you're using absolutely everything. You might have also seen in the news that there's another factor to this now that um, using this being used a lot around people in closed spaces. So you might have seen it in maternity care in the news recently. Some hospitals have banned its use because their staff were being exposed to harmful levels of it. And you can imagine if you're in the back of an ambulance and people are using this a lot um, with you, then you could be um, your health could be affected just by having too much nitrous oxide around you as well. Um, so that trying to move away from the um, big manifolds to just the canisters and then when you don't hand back a canister that's partially used because it'll just be vented in there and it's a waste of money and it's destroying the planet as well. Um, this was a really good um, uh, project done by Hannah who's on our group down in the south coast. The, she called it a bit dim and so it's a quip about reducing electricity. So um, they were able to go around the department and reduce all their screen brightness by 50% um, and no one noticed and it made no difference to what they're doing. So again, that you can see that that would save money and especially with electricity prices the way they are now, it doesn't really affect patient care um, and you can you cut your energy use in half and there'll be other things like this around the hospital that you might be able to do um, and, and find out, look at the piece of equipment you're using. And then finally, the considered cannulation. So throughout the country, you might have seen people using um, or talking about cannula reduction. So this is re reducing unnecessary cannulas. Um, and <clears throat> um, it's one of the kind of most done environmentally sustainable um, projects that you can do. So really think, does that patient really need a cannula? Um, and if they don't, maybe think about just doing the um, venipuncture instead. And um, departments, this one was an extra, um, found that they reduced 1.5 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent every year and saved £35,000 by reducing their cannulation. So again, this highlights that reducing your carbon footprint can also reduce your costs. And if you are planning to do something like this wherever you work, that's also a good lever to pull when you're talking to people who are in charge saying, oh, I'm going to save you know, save you money, reduce our environmental impact. And actually in other places, they've found that kind of 68% of people just really don't want a cannula whatsoever sitting in their arms if they don't need it and would much prefer a second blood test. So actually you're improving patient experience by not putting in a cannula that they don't need. Um, so that's, that's one of the other kind of really simple projects that have been done quite a lot. So I'm coming to the end now and the... We the Green ED project was um, trialed in eight departments uh, across the across England in the last year or so. And this is me just talking about some of the barriers we faced, just like that poor kid banging his head there. Um, the main barrier that we faced was that um, it was really difficult to create change in your departments if you don't have buy in from staff who are there permanently and senior staff, both on the nursing and the medical side. A lot of um, us as doctors rotate around and we're engaged and want to do something but if you're there for six months it's almost impossible to create change so you know you really need to get consultant and senior buy-in um, and that is something that at Arkham we're looking at trying to encourage seniors to get buy-in as much as possible the other thing is time so if there's someone in your department or the ambulance service that is keen on this can you kind of find a way from them to have dedicated time that's paid to do this because it's hard to do when you're not um, when you don't have dedicated time and the sites which had people with dedicated time did much better than those that didn't. Um, and, you know, it's coming for all of us, not just the climate crisis, but these targets that the healthcare systems have put out trying to get to net zero by 2040, 2045. 
um, you're going to start feeling pressure from bodies that you're responsible to to do this. So it's actually worth putting some time in as well to meet those targets. So those were the main barriers we faced. So that is everything today. Hopefully um, I haven't waffled on too much and we've still got some time left. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, that's my Twitter handle. That's the Greeny D's Twitter handle. You can also email environment at arkem.ac.uk.